that's that's crazy. Like one did ninety. That's crazy. Yeah. But we can certainly make some assumptions as to why yeah. that is. Did you see what if? Tell me you saw what if. I saw, yeah, we can talk about episode eight. That's what you want to talk about, right? Yeah, I want to yeah. start off with that no, as I, a as an offshoot. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Let's start out with that. I did watch it. Yeah. What up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I'm your host, Paolo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, we have a great show for our audience today. Um, we're going to be talking about some interesting uh, news items that came out this week. Some surprising numbers coming out of Venom. Some more talk about the Batman from its uh, stars, Jeffrey Wright, Robert Pattinson, the, the talk is 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 heating up around this movie um we're gonna be talking about some marvel situations and some stuff that we had previously spoke about brian about what would happen with uh scarlett johansson and this whole lawsuit and marvel being in a lawsuit of of their own so that they can i guess uh keep doing what they're doing without having to share the wealth um, but first, before we get into all of that, if you haven't seen What If Episode 8, go watch it, stop, stop this, go watch it, and come back. This episode was phenomenal. Brian, when I was watching it, and after I finished watching it, I started thinking back as to the conversation we had about what what if needed to be. Mm -hmm. And you had stated some things that I think were delivered based on what you thought what if should be. Before I get into it, I want to know, did it deliver on those things? Yeah, so this was the this was really the the culmination of a lot of things we talked about uh, with this show, and, and it started with the Doc Strange episode, which was you take take the character, take the foundation, take a storyline that we've seen or are familiar with, but don't hold back. And early in the show, they were clearly holding back. They were yeah. they were kind of playing small playgrounds, small tweaks. You know, the watcher's kind of giving you a little bit of narration, but the stakes are kind of low, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. And then in that Doc Strange episode, it kind of turned up, and you're like, oh, okay. So now we're just going to go to this dark, dark place. There's no happy ending. There's no saving the day. There's yeah. no Marvel formula bringing us back to center. We're just going to keep going with this. Mm -hmm. So then we get to this episode, and, and, and so for people at home, I was a little late to watch this episode. So Pablo had hyped this up. So I'm sitting there watching it. And if you hadn't hyped it up, I think I would have started the episode a little bit disappointed only because it started out a little bit like the beginning of the show, right? Taking yeah. Ult well, Ultron, Age of Ultron, something we'd seen before, mm -hmm. and then kind of just having this basic tweak of, well, what if he had won that battle? Okay. Yeah. But I would say the levels up for me were probably when Thanos appears, spoiler alert, and he don't last long. <laughs> But that was a moment because of everything we've been through with him on screen. Yeah. And he shows up and he's got the gauntlet and he just gets served in like two seconds. And I was like, yeah. oh, okay. It was, it was something just something else going on now. And then you could see the, the amalgamation of, I don't know what you want to call super, super vision, super Ultron. Mm -hmm. But then the moment where it goes light speed is when he says, I can see you. And that was it. When you realized that, like, the Watcher was actually going to be engaged in yeah. this, the episode went to a whole other dimension, literally. Yeah. And I thought the episode did a good job, too, of the Watcher, you know, the Watcher in the comics. Mm -hmm. Really, for the first, I think for the, 
this was the best encapsulation of like his conflict where he's watching Hawkeye and he's watching Natasha struggle as the last Avengers to solve this problem. He's like, he's like, look over there. Look over there. Yeah, it's right there. <laughs> right. How do like, I, could, I could save this? I could help them. I thought that episode did a really good job of, of you know, giving Jeffrey Wright that sort of drama, but mm -hmm. then giving him ultimately this huge action set piece, which we didn't, I didn't really think the show necessarily would ever kind of deliver on. Yeah, exactly. And then to end it with like a little twist where they bring around the Doc Strange episode and you're like, oh, <laughs> we're tying these back together. Yeah. No, it was the best episode of the show by far. Um, and as I said, I, I don't necessarily think you have to watch episode these episodes in order. I think if you wanted to go, uh, I don't think you, this one, you wouldn't get the Doc Strange reference at the end unless you saw, I think yeah, it was saw that one yeah. and see what happened to him. Yeah. But, but um, no, I think this is where this show needs to live. This is where this show needs to push things. I thought it was awesome. And I thought the, the visuals of the action were great. Too. Oh, fantastic too. The fighting, the, the, the power that, that was being displayed, the transformation of the watch into, into this warrior. It, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this again. The animation to me is, is beautiful. To me, I, I love the animation. That's one of the reasons why I like watching it, although some of the episodes aren't that great. But watching it is, I'm fine with it. But, yeah, when I was watching it, I saw all these, you know, I, 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 I remember hearing all the things that you were talking about, and it's like, wow, they delivered on going for it. Yes. And taking us somewhere completely different instead of a retelling of a story with different aspects to it right um i was i was wait, while you were talking i was thinking about would you and i think this is what we thought what if would be and that would be an anthology where these episodes live separately and it seems to be that the, these episodes are culminating into a specific event. Now, this event for this season may not end up uh, in a in a happy ever after sort of situation. It could be just sort of a continuation for the following season, maybe. Um, I hope that is the case, being that these things are somewhat tied together. But would you have preferred that what if be each episode was sort of standalone? I'm okay with the mix of both. Uh, I had the same impression you you had, which is we kind of started out in a certain place and we seem to be evolving into a different place. And I keep, you know, in my mind, actually, I keep harkening back to, to Star Trek Next Generation and Star Trek DS9, where like those series started with every episode being standalone, but then started to hatch along the way these seeds of what would become a serialized storyline later. So in particular, like in DS9, you know, things like the Cardassians, the wormhole, like all that stuff was in these individual episodes. But by the time you got to season four, you had to watch every single episode in sequence to understand what was going on because that's where the show went. This has a little bit of that feel where it's like they introduced a lot of individual elements with the one connecting character really being the Watcher. And now that the Watcher is in the game for real, mm -hmm. there's a little more connectivity. And I wouldn't be surprised if we do start to see a little more serialization going forward, but I'm okay with a little bit of separation. Like I think of, you know, even like Justice League Unlimited, all those episodes were basically part ones and part twos, but then yeah, you got yeah. to the end of the part two and the next episode would pick up something and else. you kind of be something else. And I'm all right with that. I, I don't think you have to have every show, have every episode be dependent on every other episode. So. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh... For me, this episode was amazing. I've seen it several times, and I don't know if you uh, ever heard of Comics Explained. Yeah, I'm familiar heard? with that. Yeah. yeah. He has a separate channel um, called Geek, uh, Geek Culture Explained, where he goes over this episode. And, and his reaction towards how great this episode was was hilarious to me because I was feeling a lot of those emotions about, yo, this episode is crazy. And go watch that episode of, of, of him going over um, episode eight of What If. It made me think 
of there's an emerging theme here with the watcher and i think we're going to see with eternals in a few weeks which is this it's something that ultron kind of points out in this episode this idea of you know what makes you so good you're kind of just sitting sitting by and watching all this play out you know you're not doing anything about it and obviously we know that's a central question in the eternals when sort of black knight is asking seriously like why where were you guys right i think there's this idea of now we're seeing this overlay of these almost godlike characters and beings that are pulling the strings but haven't been involved and are now getting involved and i felt very much like am i seeing a little am i seeing a little preview in this episode of where some of the multiverse and some of the eternals universe is going to take us now that the as we watch the watcher kind of crash through these dimensions and then he's kind of fighting his own battle even as these other uh pieces of the multiverse are playing out like not aware of it yeah that is a good point and i did wonder a little bit about you know the question, who did you promise this to? Who did you swear this that you wouldn't intervene? Right. You know, certainly we're going to be introduced to those godlike, godlike figures in Eternals. Um, but for the Watcher, who would that be, right? And, and there's so many, hey, there's so many entities within Marvel that it would be pretty overwhelming to see Although we're going to get our taste of it in Eternals, but it would be pretty overwhelming, overwhelming to see them constantly in, in things, right? So the references to these people who they swear they wouldn't do this or that, um, certainly places that, 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 that thought of there's someone bigger involved, but I want to see how this plays out first, obviously. Good use of Captain so, Marvel in this episode, too, oh. I thought. This is a good fight. Like it's not a long scene, but it's actually a pretty good fight scene, and the stakes are pretty high. And I thought it was super cool when he detonates the planet and then takes out the entire galaxy. I thought it was cool. That was a good. That was a good. Yo, they scene. went. They went. They went all in on this. They went all in on this. It was to me. It was amazing. That episode. Obviously, it doesn't put the What If series in our number one spot or two i think i had it either two or three you had a number one it doesn't propel it no. to to the to that status but it's certainly um there's some there's a little bit of redemption into you know it would be hard to put it at the bottom sort of sort of situation even though we no, know what that I, bottom yeah. is we got one more episode and i think you, you at least have the feeling of you're going to exit this season on an uptrend like where you're yeah. looking ahead to season two and feeling like this show yeah. has sort of figured out the oh, DNA. Yeah what oh, yeah. it's going to be and, and that's more exciting yeah and to add to that before we get into the topics of the day the fact that people are reacting to this episode and to the dr strange episode as well which was fantastic marvel obviously is going to make these changes these subtle changes or you know depending on how they're trying to tell this story but they at least now know what it takes in order to get us excited for these for these shows let's get into it black widow lawsuit um resolved and this is something that we had spoken of quite some time ago brian you called it that this is going to be settled and you know these people are going to posture even though disney was the win a little bit ham on 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 black um scarlett johansson and how they chose to approach the situation but it got settled and it was also revealed how much she got paid this is just rumor correct or this is confirmed this is more of people just talking it's, it's reported they'll, they'll yeah. never come yeah yeah so brian your reaction to this settlement and to the amount of money because we thought it would probably be less but she got, come on, she got quite a bit. Didn't we think Ooh. it was going to be less? I thought I she thought was going to probably get like 25 because the 50, the $50 million uh, mark was, was, was set in terms of what she was supposed to get. We thought we would probably go, you know, meet at least 35, 20, 25, you know what I'm saying? But it, it ended up being much more than that. A little bit more than that. I mean, I thought, look, I mean... The, the two numbers we had before this were Disney claimed she had already made 20. 
it was reported that her side modeled her compensation at 80 using the box office of Captain Marvel as a reference point. So 40 to me is it's like, yeah, shocking. Like we're, we wound up in the middle of those two numbers. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, yeah. to me, I don't know. Like, I just want to go back to when we have first had this discussion and like, there have been so many articles that came out. How did Scarlett Johansson and Disney get to this point? And this like, what does this mean for Marvel? Is it the end of Marvel? Yeah, it just was like, <laughs> I'm reminded a couple years yeah. ago, I'm not a Green Bay Packers fan, but they got off to mm -hmm. a terrible start. And Aaron Rodgers goes to the microphone after a press after a game. He goes, relax. <laughs> and that's what I feel like saying to all these people who wrote these articles, relax. Yeah. As I told you, lawyers, the next time a lawyer says something nice about a lawyer on the other side of a case will be the first. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all this was. All this was, was show strong, make a big stink, get in a room, you know, here's my number, here's your number, draw a line somewhere in the middle. And guess what? You get a press release from both sides afterwards, not only announcing the settlement, but now announcing how excited they are to work with each other. Yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, and I'm just yeah. like, settle down, people. It's yeah, all yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I sort of, I mean... I'm not in that world and don't know how that stuff works. The way lawyers talk and the things that they say, I, I, I mean, I've dealt with lawyers before, but based on the things that, that, that were said, you would think that this is not going to go well, right? The relation, we thought, I, I honestly thought the relationship between Scarlett Johansson and, and Disney was over because of how they went at her in their response to the lawsuit, right? But yeah, I guess we just have to know going into certain things like this, that this, these are the sort of stances that they're going to take against each other. And, but at the end of the day, it's all about the right number and move on. Yeah, I think, I think you can kind of fill in the blanks here. And I think it's pretty close to what we surmise, which is I'm sure that this discussion started in private prior to the decision to go day and date on Black Widow. We know that. We know that Scarlett Johansson's reps reportedly expressed concern about this yeah. two years ago. So what likely happened is they were having a negotiation in private. They got to an impasse. Disney knew it had to get the movie out by a certain date. So they went with the day and date without having a resolution on her contract and what she was going to get paid. Once that happened, her side then said, we're going to go public. We're going to make this, we're going to ugly this up in the, in the realm of public, in the court of public opinion to put pressure on Disney to come back to us with a better number. Yeah. This was not going to go to a trial it was never go that's why to yeah. me that's why i said the first time, it was never going to go to a trial there's too much to lose on both sides yeah. Yeah. and bob chapek knows that like as he said at the recent conference there's a whole fleet of these contracts he's going to have to get sorted out but you know what not all of them have the stakes and the dollar values that this one does yeah. so you know you take care of scarlett johansson scarlett johansson takes care of disney and and, and scarlett johansson is smart enough to know that look you know I wish Hollywood wasn't this way, but she's what, probably like 34 right now, 30, mm -hmm. in the mid thirties, I think, you know, the way Hollywood works, the life, the peak lifespan of an actress is not generally to where Meryl Streep is, right? It's usually yeah. you age out and you get punted to TV or you get punted to smaller. So like, she knows that if, if she burns a Disney bridge for real, like for yeah. real, for real, yeah. that's a huge loss of potential future working opportunities and compensation. So yeah. like, yeah, so better to, you know, you, you posture, you go through this exercise, you take the 40 million here. Now you get back on board with the projects that Kevin Feige wanted to work with you on. And the one, apparently there's one already in progress that Disney references in the release that they're working on with her. And it's like, life goes on and everyone makes a lot of money. And now I think the one thing Disney probably is happy about in some fine print here that we can't see there's probably something in this settlement agreement they can use in the other negotiations at lower dollar values to say, look, mm -hmm. Scarlett Johansson got this. You are not a Marvel character. You're not going to get that, but you might get, here's a step down. Here's two steps down. Mm -hmm. And it'll make those negotiations go a little bit, a little bit better. So, you know, all's well that ends well. And like I said, I just wasn't DEFCON one over this when it first hit and it's kind of come to a, come to a resolution that I think makes a lot of sense. 
Yeah. Let us know in the conversation below that were you like me and overreacted and thinking that this was the beginning of the end um, with with Marvel and, and Kevin Feige not being happy because of how they treated uh, Scarlett Johansson. Let us know in the conversation below uh, um, your thoughts on that. In another lawsuit, Marvel is suing to keep rights to Avenger ca Avengers characters from copyright termination. Brian, could you... I don't know if you understand the whole story and how this works. I'm not familiar with it. Could you let the audience know what this is all about? Yeah, I mean, this is actually the latest generation of, a, of an ongoing conflict that this industry has probably had since its inception, which is the creator of a character and the family or the estate of that creator. They rarely or don't always see the profits that spring from the character they created. Yeah. And as a result, and so the character, the rights to the character move around usually on a schedule, meaning, mm -hmm. you, you know, if a studio owns it, you usually have to do something with the character by a certain date or the rights revert back to the creator. This has happened over and over and over again. Yeah. So, in the latest iteration, you have five families tied to Marvel Comics who initially exercised sort of a copyright termination against Disney and against Marvel Studios to say, you're on the clock, we're, we're taking back the rights to would have been a lot of like a lot of the Avengers characters would uh, Spider-Man would all be going back to the family estates. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're Disney and Marvel, you're not going to want that to happen. So what this really becomes about is money, kind of similar yeah. to our last yeah. one, right? The estates are saying, look, we're, we are seeing this multi-billion dollar enterprise spring up around things that we created in print a long time ago, or the father or the grandfather created. And we're not getting paid percentage on that. And like I said, this has happened over and over again. I, mean, I think that you know, Superman has been in this boat before with, I think it's the Siegel and Schuster estates who created the comic. And then uh, I forget what movie it was. was it Superman Returns. There was a, one of the movies was made literally to beat the deadline for the rights going back to the estate and away from mm -hmm. the studio. Um, Batman has been in this place uh, as well. So uh, Spider-Man alone, I think, was in this place several times. So this is not new. And again, it, it does speak to the challenge of when you are this successful with something like this, are you taking care of everyone who helped make it possible? Yeah. And chances are you're not going to make everyone happy along the way. Mm -hmm. But I think in this case, the creators are like, look, this is our character in the end. They're not really set. Like they are threatening it, but I don't think their end game is to ultimately wrest control of the character away from the studio forever. No, it's to no. make sure that they're getting fairly compensated, compensated for the yeah. usage of the character going forward and retroactive probably to, you know, the beginning of the MCU. So I think that's, that's what's ultimately going to happen. Another check that gets written by Disney to make sure that this, that everyone's on board. What do you, th uh, do you think it's the fair thing to do? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think like, Here's the thing, I, it's impossible for me to, like, I don't know what the estates and the creators were paid along the way. So who, I can't tell you, you know, we know what the box office has been for, for the MCU combined, you know, 22, well, now I guess it's going to be like 23, 24 plus billion dollars by the end of this year. Um, I'm sure these estates have not seen even probably 2% of that, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm sure they got. I'm sure they got something, but I'm sure they've not seen a percentage of every box office dollar. Um, so the idea that like that should be completely free of charge doesn't seem doesn't sit quite right. It's like this is still they did still create it. The character's still in print in the comics, and the mm -hmm. studios are drawing from that store those storylines to make yeah, these yeah. scripts and to make these movies. So it seems fair that like if you're the creator, you ought to get some piece of that pie. Um, but it also just speaks to look. I mean, it's it's the way the world works in the sense of any anything in this world that becomes this successful, yeah. anyone who can connect themselves to it and try to earn some money off it 
is going to ask. And I think yeah. if you're a studio or a corporation or a company, it's just something that you have to be ready and prepared to say like, look, I mean, along the way, we're probably, it, it, think of it almost like a, a tax, if you will, like you're just gonna yeah. be paying parties connected to these characters to make sure everyone stays happy and you can keep, keep making the machine go. But I think the question also is, if I pay Brian, you're an artist. I pay you, hey, I need a character for this story that I'm I'm doing, whatever the case may be. And I pay you, hey, 20 grand, let's say. I paid you, you delivered the character to me, and in 10, 20 years, somebody picks it up and is now making billions. You as the artist, how are you going to feel being that you got paid for the work that you did, but now you're asking for me to give you some money based off the success of the character that you got paid to create, mm -hmm. right? That That's where the, I guess the tension lies as to, I mean, it's like, yo, Mark, Disney, you've made billions off of this stuff. Cut them a check, be happy, you know, give them something, I would say. Like here, not it, it shouldn't be, to me, it shouldn't be like, you know, you get some of the success that I get only if we go at it together or I tell you, yo, I'm going to pay you, but it has to be what's negotiated. If I'm only paying you to create a character, you created it, that's it. Yeah. But if I make billions of dollars, I can be like, yo, there was this guy, let me hit him off with something. I also think, you know, it, it depends on the nature of the agreement you strike at the time. I mean, like I, if you, you know, different example but you know peter benchley sold the rights to jaws for like 500 600 thousand dollars in 1975 like it was a one-shot closed out deal he didn't leave himself any outs to participate in the movie probably didn't think the movie was gonna he hated the movie as i recall i think he like hated what spielberg did with it and like do you think he wants that deal back of course look how much money that jaws has made over his lifespan but I think where it gets fuzzy in this case is, as I said, the storylines, right? So, it, it, like, so, so if you have like Jack Kirby's family or Steve Ditko's family, and that legacy is in the comics, and those comics are still being made today, and Disney goes in and takes as the inspiration for the script for one of its movies a run of comics that your father or grandfather was directly responsible for writing that's where i think it gets a little bit fuzzy right because you're kind of saying yeah disney got disney let's say marvel back in the day paid for the rights to this character but then double dipped and went back and actually lifted a story mm -hmm. like actual intellectual property that our family wrote mm -hmm. that you could argue might be yeah. grounds for a new agreement, right? You're kind yeah, of, of the, the character is one thing. Taking what we wrote and making it into a script is kind of different. And yeah, I think yeah. that's where, you know, there's probably a little bit of that here where it's like they see elements and they're arguing there's elements of these movies that actually came straight from the, you know, yeah. the brains of their family. And that's like, what well, we, you know, we're not getting credit for that. Yeah. yeah we're not yeah, getting no. compensation for that. So I get yeah, that. you're right. It's a, it's a fuzzy area. Um, and if the MCU hadn't worked, the lawsuit probably doesn't happen, you know? Of course. So, so. This, yeah, this certainly is not going to resolve itself soon. Hopefully there's, there's some resolution where these guys get something i mean like i'll be happy with something give me something every time you make a movie because i i think uh, the problem with marvel and, and what they're attempting to do is to like not be um pushed in a direction where they have to make this movie about this character or else they lose the rights right right so 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 i think you know they want to be have total freedom of when they want to reintroduce or do another movie with a specific character and not have to worry about losing rights. Uh, you know, like there's been, like you said, in, in, in situations where they created a movie just because they didn't want to lose the rights, you know? So I, I get where they're coming from, but all I'm saying is, you know, give these guys a piece, man. It's like, give them something. 
it's not going to hurt their pockets if they give you if they give these guys a million dollars. You know, that's strange for these guys. Anyway, let us know in the conversation below what you think is fair. Um, next up, Marvel Studio producer says there are thirty-one projects in development. I believe it. I believe it. What are those projects? Obviously, you know, name them. They're, they're, they're happening. Fantastic Four, X-Men, Wolverine, Punisher, Daredevil. All of those characters. Everything is coming to Marvel. And and I'm sure it's not just... It's, it could be 31 today, and then next year it's like, oh, we got another 20. <laughs> you know? Because they hot right now. They are hot. Brian, your thoughts on this? Yeah, no, I... I think that the, the significance of the comment is one, it speaks to how, how critical it is that Marvel can, you know, continue to diversify the, the organization, you know, beyond just Kevin Feige, right? They need to find those Michael Waldrons and the other people who can help support the engine. I think they just promoted, I think it was Victoria Alonso, who's been there a long time, is now running a, a piece of the operation now. So finding those lieutenants under yeah. Kevin Feige is, is the critical thing. But I thought it was interesting with the number, was I was trying to back into how many projects do we actually know. Now, we don't know. They didn't obviously give a list. But roughly in my mind, I think we're aware of about 20 of these, give or yeah. take. Like we just said, between TV and and um, film. So mm -hmm. it sort of indicated, like, there's 10 more that yeah. have not been made public. Maybe that's an insight. Just into, yeah. if you're thinking ratio, maybe that's an insight into how the studio works. It's like you kind of know at any given time, a little more than half of what is actually being worked on. And then to your point, next year, year after, when they do D23s or, or different events, you kind of get the next batch. And then right behind that, there's another 10. So yeah, yeah I think that seems that seems about right. But yeah, I think speaks to the behemoth that this has become yeah. for Disney. Um, Brian, when is D23? Oh, exact date. I can give you, I can look it up. So I know the streaming day is November 12th. Okay. That's a, that's a Disney plus only day. Um, okay, okay, look, D23 is November 19th through 21st. So that's the week after. Okay. And yeah, then that's gonna. Fandom that's gonna... is October sixteenth. So DC Fandom. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, you know so what I'm looking forward to that. You know yeah, yeah, I'm but they, so they go. So that's your sequence, roughly. Yeah, so. yeah. So I'm pretty sure we're gonna get, you know, other than the announcements of what um, they've made in the past of what's coming up in the pipeline, we'll possibly get some announcements as to um, uh, uh, casts. Um, footage maybe black panther because they've been filming for some time well doc strange too doc strange too trailer 100 yes I think. yes yes um so there's a lot to look forward for d23 and um let's see where if they announce new stuff i doubt it but because they they've announced so much and we and, and this we still haven't seen half of some of the stuff that they, they they've announced so it'll be interesting to see what else they have to offer uh, I think they're probably going to announce a Chloe Zhao Star Wars movie based on she answered a question about that really cryptically that indicated Interesting. she's definitely working on something Star Wars related with them. And obviously that dovetails. That's a couple of weeks after Eternal comes out. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing you might get an announcement that she's making a Star Wars movie for them. Listen, if Eternals turns out to be what it is, what, what, what we think it'll be, Star Wars is going to be on some different type level type situation. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Let's see if they announce that. Um, next up, Venom. I haven't seen Venom. I'm going to go see it after I get off the show with you. But these box office numbers are crazy. What were we at 90 million? Yeah, hope so. We Venom won 
80 million. Venom 2. No pandemic. Right. Pre pandemic Venom, 80 million. Venom 2, $90 million opening weekend. So we f- officially have our first kind of, we are more than back to pre pandemic levels mm. on a film, and it is Venom 2. Uh, you could have gotten good money from me that that would be the case, but <laughs> uh, this, this, this franchise hits something in the mainstream audience that I profess I myself don't totally understand. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a fine time at both films, mm-hmm. but I they would not be in my pantheon, in my pantheon of of superhero you know adaptations. Mm-hmm. But there is something about this character and the way it's being portrayed by Tom Hardy on screen that mainstream audiences can't get enough of. Huge, huge number. I don't, it could be that, but my theory is, is all the hoopla regarding <laughs> this Spider-Verse, with Spider, every, especially everybody talking about the end credit scene, which I haven't read into or looked at and, and found out, thank God, because I really want to be surprised, I don't, I don't want to read uh get get it spoiled for me what i'll just ask you this what was your reaction to that end credit scene uh yeah it it, it it's a, it's what you would think let's leave it okay there. okay in fact mr our favorite mr big mouth has already spoiled it so you don't <laughs> worry about it you know who i'm talking about i actually don't well who, who is notorious for letting slip spoilers and getting in trouble with the studio he works for? TH. Yeah. He's what got a tweet out about it. Ah, okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't read any history. Yeah, he doesn't it. really try to hide too much that there's some something going on there. So, when was this treat? Friday night. Opening night. Yeah. He put it out opening night. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard anything about it. I think I've seen... Actually, I think I've seen some... Uh, headlines and some YouTube videos about some leaks and I didn't, that's why I don't know because I haven't really looked into it but that's what I think is driving Marvel fans MCU Universe fans to go see this yeah, that could be fair I mean, I I don't know if you get to 90 million dollars just on a and on a 15 or 30 second scene, but I understand what you're saying. It definitely does not hurt because it is a big, it is a big moment. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, it makes me, it makes me believe that Spider-Man No Way Home is is going to be huge, huge. But but let's see. Yeah, it's it's still surprising to see. But you'll Venom. see when you see it. There's definitely some choices made with regard to how it's done. Mm-hmm. Because that was the thing I was interested in. It it definitely points you in a certain direction, which okay. is, yeah, I think is interesting. Because I think you could have done it. Remember, it's a Spider Verse. So mm-hmm. There's a lot of ways to come at that. Yeah. They chose to do it in a certain path, which yeah. definitely begs begs a lot of questions. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, let us know in the comment section below in the, uh, if you've seen Venom and what you thought of it. Um, I'm, I'll be very interested to, to know if you could just comment on that and let, let us know. Um, and we'll probably do a, a separate show on, on our review of the movie um, sometime next week. We'll see. So, I mean, just to put a bow on the box office stuff. Mm-hmm. So Venom is definitely going to run into some real stiff competition in a hurry because No Time to oh, Die is coming next week. And oh, yeah. that has opened overseas with some big numbers overseas as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but people are going to the movies. Dune is doing very well internationally. No Time to Die opened huge internationally. Obviously, the UK audience went big on that one. No surprise. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But it kind of says people are comfortable enough with what's going on in the world that if their local theater is open, people go. are buying tickets. Now, I did not run into any more of a crowd at this film than I did. I actually thought there were more people at the Shang-Chi um, 
showing that I went to initially than there were at this. Uh, but obviously this box office was, was significantly higher. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of saying like early tracking numbers for global box and some of these, you're getting back to pre-pandemic levels. You're at least starting to see projections of these films moving to the 700, 800, you know, so the billion dollar range is not that far off if, if for, for at least some of these, I mean, I wouldn't put it out of the question. No time to die. I could do it. Mm -hmm. The reviews are good, obviously. So that's, that's, that's helping too. Mm -hmm. Uh, although I will say the Venom reviews, I made this comment to you on text. I went in and started reading <laughs> kind of the actual scores. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a little bit of great inflation going on because there were definitely reviews in there where the reviewer was given two stars or like on a letter grade was grading the film as a C or C plus and Rotten Tomatoes was counting that as a fresh review. And I'm like, I don't think that used to be the case. Yeah. The reviews are a bit better than the first one. I found the quality comparable. Yeah. Um, it kind of just, if you like the first one, I think you will like the second one because it went in on the things that the, that the first one tried to do. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that it's like meaningfully different than the first one is yeah. what I would say in terms of quality for me. Yeah. Which again, tells me that it's connection to the Spider-Verse is what has people interested. Some, you know, some of these movies could be just okay and still make bank because of his connections and people want to see those connections especially mcu fans when they you know they want to they want to they want to have all these theories and connect the dots and that's what's fun about going to the movies and see those things you know who i thought was i walked out of the theater thinking in some ways might be one of the biggest winners of how well venom is doing is aquaman 2 mm. because that's another movie I know mm -hmm. not your favorite, but another movie that kind of, for whatever reason, found this lane that everyone around the world really, really liked. And Venom 2 at least shows you that if you kind of give people more of the same and it is a little bit different than your MCU tone, apparently there's a big audience for that. So it made me walk out thinking, you know, box office for Aquaman 2 might be looking up because of what just happened here. I know it's a year off, but just saying. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I know you don't like we'll that, see. but because <laughs> I know we're going to talk about it. But, yeah. Um. Yeah. Let us know in the comments below below what you guys think about this Venom box office juggernaut that it seems to be. Um. Next up, Jeffrey Wright talks playing a black commissioner Gordon in the Batman, and this is the subject, Brian, that we have talked and we have spoken about on numerous occasions. Um, with regards to Black Panther, Superman, and, and, and perhaps others. But um, and, and in this article, again, um, the articles are in the description below. He, he, he's, I was reading it and I was like, you make a lot of sense. Um, and not to say that you didn't make sense, Brian. <laughs> I just don't want to, you know, I just like the, the characters who they are already. You know, with slight tweaks, I don't need. I don't think that a, 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 a change is necessary in order for a character to continue being great, right? I think their involvement should be of the 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 same character that was written and just evolved, but not evolved where they changed the person completely, right? But I just want to read an excerpt of uh, Jeffrey Wright's uh, uh, comments on, on this on this uh, issue. There have been some who think there has been some who I think have made more of it than they probably should, which I think reveals some deficiency um, in our country. And in, in its first iteration in 1939, Gotham, Gotham City was fashioned after an American metropolis, most like New York City or Chicago. In 1939, New York was 90% white. The power structure and law enforcement in that city at the time would not have been inclusive of someone who looked like me. That's the historical fact. But as these stories have continually evolved over these many decades, not only through the comics, but also through the films, they've been reinterpreted through writers, directors, and actors to be more contemporary to the times that they were made. Right now, if we were to imagine a Gotham City based on a 
on an American metropolis to think of it as a place as a place that's only inhabited by white people is to be pretty idiotic, to be beholden to the demographic reality of 1930, 1939 urban America. What the f is the purpose of that? I understand. I understand completely. But still, (laughs) (laughs) you know, for me, Bruce Wayne is who he is. Could you turn into black? But it's like, like what would be? I I, I just, I just fail to see the reasoning behind doing it, right? What what would be the reasoning behind doing it? For me, it's easier, I, I think, to create a new character that has, you know, even more or as much as the same complexities that Bruce Wayne and Superman and some of these other characters who are who look Caucasian and are Caucasian, depending on, on where they come from. Um, it's fine. You know, I think you, you, you create a new character. It's similar to the, the comment made by J, um, Daniel Craig regarding James Bond. He's a man. You can create another character that's just as good of a character for a female. Why the switch? But, you know, I, under, I understand. I understand your thoughts on, on his comments regarding that. Yeah, you know my thoughts. I mean, I'm with, I'm with him on this. I mean, this is, this is the whole crux of what I was saying when we first talked about POC in the context yeah. of these characters. It's that... It, he, he's he's encapsulating perfectly when Bob yeah. Kane invented Batman, America looked a lot different. Yeah. And and so you're basically just he is playing, in my opinion, he is playing a character where the ethnicity can be flexible without yeah. sacrificing what makes exactly. the character valuable to Batman, mm-hmm. valuable to the story, mm-hmm. and valuable to Gotham. Um yeah. and, and that includes Barbara Gordon, right? Like I don't think if you want to play that out, I don't think that matters. Like, I, I think it's fine. Like, I just think it's, it would bother me, again, it would kind of bother me if a Batman movie was kind of turned into like a referendum on that issue. Yeah. If that makes sense. That yeah. one I would be like, well, that's not really, I don't know what that's helping. But if you're yeah. just, what, what I don't think that's what he's saying. What he's simply saying is, look, you know, society looks different today. A place like New York City. I mean, by the way, a place like New York City where, you know, the, you know, I think the, the Democratic primary winner recently is in, is an African-American former cop, just mm-hmm. for what it's worth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very different than 1939. And so I think if you just have Jeffrey Wright as Jim Gordon and portray, and he portrays his interpretation of Jim Gordon, and it's almost just taken as like, normal self-evident and just a, a part of the universe mm-hmm. i think that's great i think that's totally yeah. fine i don't have a i don't i don't have a problem at all with that yeah. and honestly if you wanted to introduce you know there's a way honestly if you want to work race and ethnicity into that storyline organically you can probably do it in a very subtle way that is not mm-hmm. intrusive to the batman you could even have something where like he and bruce have a connection that dates to something about that like I, there are ways to do that without it being so up front and center to where you feel like it's sort of competing with this Matt Reeves detective um, story that he's going for. So no, I, can, I, I on this particular point, for this particular character, completely agree with yeah. what Jeffrey Wright saying. Yeah, I never had a problem with switching of characters like, like, like Jim Gordon. And I think Jeffrey Wright is a fantastic actor, man. I think he's gonna kill it. And I'm gonna reiterate that I think He'll probably be the first dude to win an Oscar and an Emmy for the same character. <laughs> it's quite, it's there for him because he is that great. In my my opinion, he is that great, and and I think he, he this is the opportunity to see that. Uh, but let's see if it happens, yo. If I if that happens, yo, people gotta put some respect on me. <laughs> because <laughs> this no I nobody has said this or I haven't heard anybody say this as, as much videos that I watch nobody has said this but this could be it um what if he gets yeah. it for, what if he gets the Emmy for the watcher though 
Did he kiss them for the while? I, I don't know. I don't bro. think he's at that level, but I was yeah, saying yeah, the yeah, last yeah. episode, like all of a sudden he's like, ooh, like, there, there <laughs> might be something here. Like he might be going for uh, uh, some awards fair. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah. I hear you. I, 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 I can't wait to see his portrayal, and I, I, I can't wait to see his his dynamic with Pattinson. I think yes. I'm very excited to see that. Yes. Um, speaking of the Batman and Pattinson, he praises what he's seen of Matt Reeves, the Batman. We haven't heard anyone say otherwise, Brian. No. Everyone has been at. It's like, how do I explain it? So it's like everybody says it with such respect, and the, and the kind of respect too that they're not saying they're unwilling or will not say anything more other than, "Wait till you see this." Sure, right. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to keep on saying it until the cows come home. This movie is going to break records, I think. If you think Venom, it's incredible what Venom is doing. When the Batman comes out, my friend, it is going to be crazy. This is going to be the best Batman we have ever seen. No, until. Uh, and listen, I'll eat crow if the movie is horrible. But I don't think that is the case. The people involved in this movie are very reputable, very talented individuals. If you look at the cast of the Batman, there are talented actors and actresses in this film who do not say anything other than wait till you see this. Brian. And the way you saw, did you see the video of, of him uh, saying um, his comments yeah. regarding the Batman? Yeah. He, the dude looks like he, he, he's, he's, he looks so confident in what he was saying. What were your thoughts on this? Oh, I mean, yeah, I think it's, I think it's just fun because now we're getting into that phase where we, we really get hyped and, and we see some more footage of fandom and we can really start to genuinely build toward, um, you know, the release date for this. But yeah, no, I mean, between, you know, we've had Pattinson, we've had Jeffrey Wright, we've had Andy Serkis. I think we didn't talk about Zoe Kravitz, put her in the mix. She had some very, you know, very specific comments about the script and, and what she was trying to do with Selena Kyle and, and mm -hmm. Catwoman. And she even kind of said like, you know, if I, if I get buried in everything that's been sort of rumored and described about this film, then like it gets in the way of my ability to, to sort of unleash the character that, that Matt Reeves is looking for and that I'm trying to create. So yeah. I, I think everyone, the themes are all the same, that it's unique, it's original, it's adult. Um, you know, there's, there's points of emphasis that we haven't seen before with regard to, with regard to Batman. And you're right, you know, you put with this kind of talent in the movie that the floor is only so, you know, the floor is pretty high. Um, so no, I, I, th I have no, I have no concerns. I have no concerns about the quality. I, you know, there's, there's been a lot of noise around this. I still don't have a lot of concerns about that either. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I'm just, I'm just excited to see the footage and hopefully, you know, we can get to the place where people are just a hundred percent in on, on uh, getting a new a new Batman movie, but you're right. I mean, I think, I think if the fandom trailer, I expect it to be as I expect it to build thematically and tonally on what the fandom teaser was a mm -hmm. year ago. I think people are going to be incredibly, incredibly hyped coming out of fandom. I mean, how is this not the number one thing people are leaving fandom talking? I don't yeah. care what I know that DC is going to show some Flashpoint stuff and they're going to talk Aquaman too. I, I know there's some other, but Black how Adam. is this not Black Adam? But how is this not number one? Like, I don't know how you walk out of the event and, and be like, this has been trumped by something else. I mean, the one thing that could sort of be on the same level as possibly Black Adam, I'm really interested in to see how they show or what they show. Do you think they show? that superhero effect camera work they were talking about i'm not convinced we see it 
I think yeah. it'll be if I was if you ask me, Brian, and I'm being asked what should we show, or I would show a glimpse of that, at least a glimpse. Yeah, they probably should. I think you should, you have to show it and not go ham and show everything, but not show the Aquaman suit in the trailers. You know, show something that makes us our imagination go uh, go wild on, on, on this in, in this movie. And so I'm hoping that they deliver and not the the horribleness that was shown to us in the last fandom, right? Um. But yeah, let's see what they what they deliver on that day with the Batman. And I'll say this before we move on to our last topic of Jason Momoa uh, and Aquaman 2, is that I'm quite certain, Brian, and this is just to sort of put this to bed, that there were issues in this movie. There, were, there was tension. To me, it only shows how serious Matt Reeves uh, was about making this movie and how he wanted this movie to be with regards to each of the characters that were there and the story that he was trying to tell. And when you don't get what you want, you're going to demand it from people and people are going to be hesitant and they're going to push back and then deliver the line. That's it, right? So... Zoe Kravitz actually has a quote on this. I'm going to try to just pull it quickly because she she talks about a lot of the things that you and I kind of speculated on um, with regard to the production and why kind of some of the some of the angst was coming down um, around this. And I'm trying to find, but she references the Matt Reeves side of it. Um, I'm trying to try to pull it quickly where, where he says. Um, but she talks a lot. She talks about a lot of good things. But she makes a reference. I can't find. She makes a reference to because of the pandemic, mm-hmm. the intensity of having to do this for an entire year. And she kind of describes like every day I'm getting up at you know insanely early hour, and they're they're putting my makeup on, and I'm putting the cat suit on, and then I got to go shoot for you know 12, 14 hours, and then she's like, and then I got to go home, and then I got to work out and do all the stuff that they're asking me to do physically. And then I got to come back and inhabit this character again, day after day after day after day. And then the production shuts down and I got to come back and do it again months later. She's telling you, I think, what made this hard, which yeah, is yeah. that these characters were being, were very dramatic, um, deep characters portrayals mm-hmm. and probably went to some dark places <laughs> in the name of what Matt Reeves is trying to accomplish. And to do that, two or three times longer than they, the actors all originally signed up to, to do it, it's hard. I mean, they're human beings in the end, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. hard. I think that's what she's speaking to. Yeah, let us know in the comment section below what you guys are looking forward to in the fandom, which is supposed to be coming up October 16th. 16th. Two weeks. It works out great because you get No Time to Die next week. Mm-hmm. You get fandom the next week and then Dune the week after that. Slots in very nicely. And then Eternals is two weeks after Dune, I think. Yeah. And then you get the Disney streaming day. Then you get D23. A lot of stuff to talk about. It all kind of, it all kind of, <laughs> And then Hawkeye comes out around Thanksgiving and then No Way Home and, and Book of Fett. It yeah. all lines up nicely. Yeah. <laughs> um, for our final topic, Jason Momoa teases more comedy and bigger action in Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. I have no idea what this movie's about. <laughs> None. And the fact that there's I mean, we got a lot of bigger action. I mean, you know, the Aquaman was had a lot of action in it. The comedy that they attempted to do in that movie was not very, in my Maybe I don't, you know, my sense of humor is tough, but I didn't find it comical. I didn't find anyone. I didn't laugh once in that movie. I think if I can't remember where I, I can't, I don't, I can't look at that movie and say, well, it was a funny moment. 
I can remember when they attempted to be funny, but not that it was funny. So to me, this just makes me not not even concerned because I was never concerned about this movie. I was just gonna think that you know this movie is not gonna get any better than what the last one did, in my opinion. It's gonna probably be the same, a few changes here and there, and it's still gonna be. This is going nowhere at the end. When the movie is done, this is going nowhere. <laughs> Your thoughts on this? I think it's the only way they can go, to be quite honest. I mean, when you can, you know, when you can with a straight, a seemingly with a straight face, you know, play a cover of Toto's Africa <laughs> as he's walking out of the ocean. <laughs> I just feel like the only way you can go is to just double down on that. How can you how can you step back and say now we're going to make a grittier, more serious version? Mean, there is no path to that. Like this is a movie where like Nicole Kidman has flippers and seems all right with it. Like <laughs> I, I just there isn't any other way. And so that's where I go back to my Venom comments where I'm like, all right, well at least the box office audience is showing you that they kind of are okay if you have this kind of unique little niche and want to go lean into it. And that seems to be what they're, what they're doing. I, I'm with you. Like it'll probably be campy again. It'll probably be offbeat. It'll probably be like, why is this movie doing as well as it's doing? But as I said, I just Listen. don't see any other way for them forward after what the sort of, I don't know what to call it, like eighties video game that they went with in the first one. And I liked it better than you did, but I'm just saying it yeah. it's like visually jarring when you see the colors and you hear the music and you're sort of like, what, what is it? Like, it's just, it is a little different. I did not like that scene where uh, Nicole Kidman was fighting those, 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 those robots, not robots, those. Oh, like um, in the lighthouse? Yeah, yeah. That looked like Power Rangers to me, man. I was like watching an episode <laughs> of Power Rangers. Listen. If they would have casted anyone else for this role, granted, he was already casted, but if it would have been anyone else playing Aquaman, this movie does not make a billion dollars. This movie doesn't get made a second time. Jason Momoa made a billion dollars happen. He's, he's running this, in my opinion. Jason Momoa is the one writing... He wrote the first the first draft, I guess. I, I, yeah, that's I what we think. That's yeah. what we think. Yeah. So he is very much involved in calling the shots of what this movie is going to be. More comedy, bigger action. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what this movie is. I have no idea. But um, yeah. That is our show for today. Please let us know in the comment section below. Um, what you think about this Jason Moore uh, comedy and bigger action tease? Um, I think it's going nowhere. This movie, t I I'm not looking forward to this movie. <laughs> I'm going to go see it because, you know, we got to talk about it and stuff like that, but I'm not going to. If th This was one of those moments where I wish we were in 2021 and this movie was coming out in 2021 so I can watch it at home. But unfortunately, I'm gonna be forced to go see it at first weekend or whatever, just to, just so that we can stay up to date and talk about it. But um, let us know in the comment section below what you think about the Batman Venom of Marvel Studios. Let us know who is your favorite character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and what character are you looking forward to seeing? Richard Ryder is one of the characters that people keep mentioning. And there was one sequence I thought about how they introduced this, this character. We get to see, obviously, and it's been mentioned before that we'll probably get to see when Thanos came to Xandar. And it'll probably be the first 10 to 20 minutes of the movie. And then we see Richard Ryder's story arc, I guess, from that moment on. That makes the most sense uh, for that character and how they introduce him. Uh, Brian, any last words before we... Call it a day. 
No, I can't wait to hear your reaction to, to Venom, which we'll have in the, in the next show. And then very excited to see James Bond next week. Yeah, I got to buy my tickets for that. I'm pretty sure I'm, it's going to be interesting to go when you go in Fandango and see what seats are available for that movie. Yeah. Um, but that's that. That's uh, yeah. I can't wait to see this movie. Um, but yeah, hit the like button, hit the subscription bell, hit the notification bell, hit the subscription, um, and let your friends know and share this content with people. We want people to sort of think about what's going on in this genre and in the you know business aspect of it, and just sort of determine where all of this stuff is going. Um, we still see for the next ten years we're gonna be running strong. Barring any horribleness from DC and Sony, but as long as I think the MCU keep doing keeps doing what they're doing, they they they're like the last stand right now. Right now they're at the top, but when things go bad, they'll be the ones the last stand before we call it a day. If if things go bad, a la the the Western days. But as our show for today, let us. Uh, uh, Again, hit the subscription bell, and we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gym Report.